Right engine's on fire. Chop everything to it. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors and let you know that there will be spoilers ahead. Today, on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on Fate is the Hunter, 1964. As you probably know, I've expanded the podcast to include YouTube videos. The plan is to release a podcast every two weeks and then release a video in the intervening week. We'll see how it goes. But your support is critical to the operation. Please comment on the podcast or the videos and tell me which films interest you. Your support through comments or purchases at the merch store are greatly appreciated. Links are in the description. I have always liked this film. I'm a general aviation buff anyway. The story is compelling and the acting is superb. Who could not like a film with Nancy Kwan and Suzanne Flechette? The film has a pretty low 6.8 score on imdb.com. On RottenTomatoes.com, the film has a 40% on the tomato meter and 62% audience score. I feel the film is better than that. New York Times film critic Bosley Carruthers didn't like the film and said in part in a December 10, 1964 review, quote, is a film you may be sure will never be shown as an in-flight diversion in commercial airplanes, and it might be better for airline travelers if they never see it any place. For not only is it about the crash of a commercial airplane in which 53 are killed, but it also makes airplane travel look more chancy than taking a rocket into space. Mr. Ford makes a dismal discovery, which is heavily hinted at early, that the accident was caused by a cup of coffee spilling over an instrument box and short-circuiting some of the critical wiring. Man, that coffee. But it's a stupid, annoying film. Unquote. Yeah. Actors. Right. And I'm a Shakespearean actor. We have a massive number of returning actors, so let's get going. Lynn Ford played the role of airline executive and crash investigator Sam McBain. Ford is one of my favorite actors and was first covered in the excellent film, Blackboard Jungle, 1955. Rod Taylor played cavalier and swaggering pilot, Captain Jack Savage. Taylor never fails at being exciting. He was first covered in the campy sci-fi, World Without End, 1956. Jane Russell had a small bit where she played herself. Russell was first covered in the first of the Billy Jack trilogy, The Born Losers, 1967. Underdog voicer Wally Cox played wartime radio engineer Ralph Bundy. This actor was first covered in the tremendous anti-war film The Bedford Incident, 1965. Nehemiah Persoff was solid as airline engineer Ben Sawyer. Persoff was first covered in the film noir sweet science movie The Harder They Fall, 1956. Portrayer of angry guys Burt Freed played family lawyer Dylan. Freed was first covered in the second film of the Billy Jack trilogy, Billy Jack, 1971. Dorothy Malone had a small part as heiress Lisa Bond and short-term fiancé of Savage. Malone was first covered in the Western noir, Warlock, 1959. Constance Towers had a small role as McBain's secretary, Peg Burke. Towers was first covered in the beloved John Wayne Civil War film, The Horse Soldiers, 1959. Nancy Kwan played the racially attacked ichthyologist Sally Frazier. Kwan was born in China in 1939. Her father was a Chinese architect that worked for British intelligence in World War II. Kwan's mother was a model of Anglo origin. Kwan's father escaped with her and another sibling ahead of the attacking Japanese at the beginning of World War II. The family, Sans the mother, remained in northern China for five years before returning to a wealthy life in Hong Kong. The young Quan had a pony and was an excellent rider, as shown in today's film. Quan attended a local Catholic girls' school until she was 13. She then transferred to Kingsmore School, where she studied dancing. After studying Tai Chi, Quan decided to study ballet. At 18, she began studying at London's Royal Ballet School. Quan applied for a Ray Stark production role, but didn't do well with her acting test. She was given a small role in the stage performance of The World of Susie Wong. Francis Nguyen was offered the lead role in the film, but was forced to withdraw. Kwan was then selected for the role of a Hong Kong prostitute in The World of Susie Wong, 1960. She was terrific, 
opposite veteran actor William Holden. Kwan was nominated for the Best Actress in a Drama Golden Globe Award for this role, but only won the Golden Globe for Most Promising Newcomer in the Female category. Kwan should have been nominated for the Best Supporting Actress Oscar. However, the competition was too stiff, with Shirley Jones winning for Elmer Gantry 1960, also playing a prostitute. Also nominated were Glennis Johns for The Sundowners 1960 and Janet Lee for Psycho 1960. Kwan's fame skyrocketed when Flower Drum Song 1961 was released. She was on the cover of Vogue magazine and had a hairstyle named after her cut. Kwan continued to make films and travel the world. Today's film, Fate is the Hunter 1964, was her sixth film. Kwan played an island native in the comedy Lieutenant Robin Caruso, USN 1966, where she wanted the stranded Dick Van Dyke to marry her. I will never understand why Van Dyke got on that helicopter to leave. Kwan later appeared in the Dean Martin James Bond spoof The Wrecking Crew 1968. During the film, she met the great martial artist Bruce Lee and the pair became good friends. Kwan was also active on television with roles in Kung Fu 1972-75 and Hawaii 5 1968-1980, to 1980, including the pilot. In 1972, Kwan returned to Hong Kong to be with her ailing father. While she continued to work in Asia, her popularity in America faltered. She had expected to spend a year in Hong Kong, but stayed for nearly a decade. When Kwan returned to America, she acted in miniseries and nighttime soap operas. She also continued in movies. One notable film from this era was Dragon, the Bruce Lee Story, 1993, an origin story of her old friend. Kwan is still alive and acting as of this writing. Suzanne Flechette played the crash-surviving stewardess Martha Webster. Flechette was born in 1937 in New York City. I'm walking here! I'm walking here! Her father was a television executive and her mother was a former dancer. Flechette attended New York City's High School of the Performing Arts, although she did not feel she was a gifted actor. After high school, Flechette attended Syracuse University and Finch College for a semester each. Afterwards, she attended the Neighborhood Playhouse and was trained by Stanford Meisner. This lovely actress debuted on Broadway in 1957. Her first television role was also that year. The following year, Lachette was in the Jerry Lewis comedy The Geisha Boy, 1958. She mainly continued in television roles with a few films sprinkled in. On Broadway, she replaced Anne Bancroft as Helen Keller in The Miracle Worker. In 1963, Lachette had a part in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, 1963. Other films include the Raoul Walsh directed A Distant Trumpet, 1964. Of course, Fate is the Hunter, 1964. Disney's The Ugly Dachshund, 1966. Disney's Blackbeard's Ghost, 1968. Comedy Western Support Your Local Gunfighter, 1971. And The Shaggy DA, 1976. During this period, she was also extremely active on television. In 1972, Bichette began her role as Emily Hartley on The Bob Newhart Show, 1972 to 1978. Hi, Bob. She was in 142 episodes where the couple usually spent time talking while laying in bed. Bob Newhart had another show called Newhart from 1982 to 1990 where he was an innkeeper. For the final episode of Newhart, Bichette returned as Emily Hartley. Newhart woke with his wife from the first show, turning the later show into just a dream sequence. Lachette was diagnosed with cancer in 2007 and died the following year. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The movie begins with a consolidated airplane being loaded for flight. Company executive Sam G. McBain, Glenn Ford, exits his office. At the dispatch area, airline pilot Jack Savage, Rod Taylor, asks McBain if he wants to go fishing. McBain looks at Savage's basket and fishing tackle with incredulity. McBain gives weather information to the Director of Operations and Maintenance, Ben Sawyer, Nehemiah Persaw. Savage razzes McBain for being so devoted to the airline and talks about McBain's assumed forthcoming promotion. McBain and Sawyer inform Savage that Sawyer is up for the same job and it is far from a done deal. Savage tells McBain that his money is on him and they should get together soon. On Savage's flight, stewardess Martha Webster... Susan Flechette, and Darcy, 
Mary Ann Case preparing the plane for departure. Savage and his co-pilot, Joe Partridge, come onto the flight. Savage flirts with the ladies. And uh, I'm Jack Savage. Yeah, he's the one I warned you about. <laughs> Wanting to see Darcy again, he asks that she bring him a cup of coffee when she has time. The crew goes through the pre-flight checklist as the passengers board the plane. As a trope, they have a small child traveling alone. Savage seems a little distracted as the plane begins to taxi. The plane is heading from Los Angeles to Seattle. Savage is disappointed when Martha brings the coffee forward. Martha is seated in the cockpit as the plane begins to take off. As the plane climbs, there is a bang as the right engine explodes, starting a fire. Right engine's on fire. Chop everything to it. Savage is cool. He orders everything cut to that engine and the fire extinguishers turned on. Savage calls for an emergency landing, but can't because three planes are in the pattern. The fire is out and the left engine is working well. Savage notes that his coffee is spilled. Suddenly, the radio goes out and the warning bells ring, noting that the left engine has also gone out. Savage orders all the power and fuel going to the left engine to be cut. Martha sees that both engines are out and she is told that the passengers should be made ready for a crash. The air traffic control team says the plane has fallen below the radar. Co-pilot Murray is happy as Savage guides the doomed flight onto a flat, sandy beach. The landing is going fine and the plane is slowing. To their horror, the pilots see a wooden pier ahead. As it hits, the plane explodes into a massive fireball. The credits begin to roll over the billowing flames. Fire trucks, ambulances, reporters, and onlookers arrive. McVean and Vice President Stillman Robert J. Wilkie, arrive at the crash site. McBain and Sawyer see that the landing was level, and they may have been okay if not for the pier. Three people, including Martha, were thrown clear and survived the crash. McBain and Sawyer examine the cockpit and see the empty coffee cup. Proctor, Robert F. Simon, from the Civil Aeronautics Board, takes over the crash and asks for a place to store the wreckage. McBain is beset by reporters, including Dan Crawford, Max Showalter, McBain says that the right engine failed after takeoff. Sawyer says the failed engine did not cause the crash because the left engine was still working at the last radio contact. McBain defends Pilot Savage. An airline executive explains how a black box works. Wow, long time back. Stillman says the FBI think it may be sabotaged because one passenger took out almost $400,000 of flight insurance. McBain orders the plane checked for explosives over the objections of Civil Aeronautics Board Proctor. The mother of the child stumbles through the crash site and finds her child's doll. Reporter Crawford tells McBain that two more passengers died, leaving only Martha. Crawford says it is tough luck. McBain says luck has nothing to do with it. Crawford says the pier should have been removed two days prior, but the contractor extended his hunting trip because the hunting was good and delayed the job. McBain states again, the crash is not the result of luck. McBain goes to the hospital and grills Martha about what happened on the flight. She says the warning lights for both engines were on and the alarm was ringing. Martha breaks down with survivor's guilt. I looked in and the alarm bell was ringing. The red lights were on, both lights. And I... Wait a minute, both lights? Are you sure? Closed the door and I went back. <laughs> and there they were. Uh, that... Pete, that will be all. The parts of the airplane are gathered in a giant hangar. One of the inspectors finds seagull feathers in the right engine, explaining why the engine failed. An ornithologist says this gull species rarely flies to the land side and should have never been at this location. Feathers of a gull known as Pacific Kittiwake. Extremely rare visitors to this season of the year. Practically never on the landward side. Strictly an offshore bird. Yet there he was, on your landing strip, waiting to be sucked into the jet chamber to choke it. Very strange for any gull to have done that. Sawyer and McBain are taken to the left engine, and it is in perfect working order. This contradicts what Martha previously stated. The men are informed that the black box has been destroyed as well. They haven't given up on the sabotage theory either. They have identified passenger Stanley Richards, which may have been played by Bert Stevens. Proctor, Sawyer, and McBain go to listen to the voice recording. Crawford comes in with a new scoop that Savage was seen in a bar a few hours before takeoff. McBain still defends his friend. 
Savage was seen in two bars with a very drunk friend. Sawyer reminds McBain that Savage came from a flying circus and was quite a partier back in the day. Sawyer and McBain argue about the fault of the crash. Stillman, Rocker, Sawyer, McBain, and another man listen to the flight tape in the tower. McBain points out that Savage's voice shows he is clear and in control. All three planes that kept Savage from immediately landing were off their schedule, another act of fate. Proctor and the crew were called by the FBI. Stanley Richards' luggage was found, and it was clear. They also say that Richards' traveling companion had a premonition about the flight and failed to board. That is when Richards bought the insurance. I'm flashing back to Sonny Bono and Van Heflin. Secretary Peg Burke, Constance Towers, allows Mark Hutchinson to enter the room. The report of the drinking has hit the newspapers. They are worried that they will be sued. Stillman, Hutchison, and Stevenson attack the character of Bachelor Savage. One even says he is dating a Chinese. Let's face it, Sam. Jack wasn't a so-called ideal image to begin with. What do you mean by that? Well, a bachelor like that? Yeah. The public likes to think of these guys as family men. You know, houses, mortgages, kids, and so on. Well, it just so happens that I am a bachelor, too. You are not a line pilot. And during the last year, you did bounce from an heiress to a stripper to I don't know what else. The last one was a Chinese girl. Their words, not mine. McBain fights back against the smearing of the pilot. McBain says he was a co-pilot with Savage during the war. Sawyer and McBain fight again. Stillman demands that they blame Savage. After the men leave McBain's office, Peg comes into the room. She makes sense in saying it wasn't one thing, but many things that caused the crash. She also warns him he will not get the promotion if he goes against the team and defends Savage. McBain goes to the bar where Savage was seen before the flight. Bartender Bernie, Stanley Adams, says he is sure it was Savage who was drinking. Bernie mentions that the man with Savage was cropped. The waitress, Laurie Mitchell, says the friend's name is Mickey. They also say Savage paid the band to play Blue Moon. McBain goes to an upscale apartment complex where Savage used to live. McBain finds the checkered jacket that Bernie said Savage wore in the bar. A fish tank in the room seems out of character for Savage. There is a small accordion. McBain looks at a lady's garter. A lady's garter, if please. Right out for everybody to see why it's downright indecent. It triggers a flashback to the war where Jane Russell, playing herself, is entertaining the troops at a USO show. Savage and McBain are together. They are wearing the World War II China, Burma, India Theater CBI patch, which may indicate that Savage was connected with the Flying Tigers. Russell throws her garter and McBain catches it. He wins a date with the actress slash singer. Savage arrives while McBain is getting ready for his date to tell him it is canceled because he has to fly a cargo mission in the morning. Savage takes Russell on a date, splashing mud on McBain as they drive by. In the morning, Russell and Savage come back from their date. McBain and the crew have been waiting for Savage to arrive so they can leave on the cargo flight. Savage has obtained another garter. He is sleepy and plans to rest while McBain does the difficult flight. From the footage, it seems like they are flying over the hump from India to China over the eastern edge of the Himalayan mountains. The hump was and still is one of the most dangerous places to fly on the planet. As Savage requested, crewman Ralph Bundy, Wally Cox, tells him they are over a Japanese base. Savage goes on the radio and broadcasts an accordion-backed, off-key version of Blue Moon. McBain tells Savage that the plane is overweight and losing altitude. Savage takes over the flying while McBain helps two men parachute from the plane. Bundy is stuck and Savage says he will take care of him. McBain is ordered to jump. Back at the airbase later, McBain and the two men that jumped are brought back. It looked like they've had a week or two of wear. They are shocked that the plane Savage was flying is already back at the base. Savage is a hero for having saved Bundy in the plane. Savage gets rewarded with a command in Greenland. Savage gloats over McBain. He then gives the second garter to McBain. Returning to present time, McBain sees a picture of a woman, Lisa Bond, Dorothy Malone. The landlady says the woman is a Pasadena heiress. McBain plans to visit Lisa, even though she may be in mourning. When McBain arrives, Lisa is having a lively party at her house. 
Her excuse is the party was scheduled and couldn't be stopped in time. Lisa could care less because they had a short romance that began with Savage rescuing Lisa from a broken airport bathroom door. McBain gets snotty about her attitude, but Lisa stops him and begins to tell her and Savage's story. Savage didn't fit into her world. Lisa also says Savage was seen a few weeks later with a Chinese. Their word, not mine. McBain pushes Lisa, and she says that Savage was totally unreliable. Well, then in that case, he was the most unreliable, irresponsible, and unregenerate man I ever met. McBain calls Peg and says they're sunk when it comes to defending Savage. Peg reports that Savage broke up with the Chinese girl he was dating in a short fashion because he changed his insurance beneficiary to a woman named Sally Frazier. McBain goes to Marineland of the Pacific. Is that the same as the Cetacean Institute? Admiral, there be whales here! He is taken to a laboratory where Sally Frazier, Nancy Kwan, is working as a researcher and she is Chinese. McBain is shocked that she has an English-based last name. Sally talks about being a World War II orphan in China. She also says that Savage told her McBain was a good man. Sally flashes back to meeting Savage. She was riding and he was fishing. The ichthyologist Sally leaps off her horse to attack Savage, who is netting a trout he has hooked. The fish gets away and he tries to throw her into the water. No! What? What the hell your mind is a beauty? That's right! Let him go! They begin to talk, and before long, it's love. Their meeting is the day of his engagement party with Lisa. Since he didn't really want to marry Lisa, he hung out with Sally. Savage knew his late arrival and smelling of fish would end the engagement. I want to stop it altogether. What kind of a person are you? Another fish getting off a hook. If you didn't want to get married... Why didn't you tell us so? I didn't really have anything to say about it. First time I knew I was engaged was when I read it in the papers. But I think it's all settled. I've been working on this flight plan for quite some time now. I think it's cruel. No, not cruel. It's crude. The minute I barge into the kitchen with these, it'll all be over. Her friends will celebrate her return to sanity and her fans will cheer her escape. Sally, don't look so worried. It's as right as rain for her too. Sally says Savage was kind and considerate. Sally says she will use the insurance money on research. She says the crash was a result of fate. McBain rejects this out of hand. It may even occur to you then that perhaps fate has been moving you too, every step you've been taking. She replies that fate is the same as God with a divine plan. Sally mentions that Ralph Bundy had visited her earlier in the day. They decide to go see Ralph, hoping to find the elusive Mickey. Bundy tells that during the bailout, he was frozen and was fighting to not jump. Savage stayed with the struggling plane to save Bundy. After the struggle, Savage forces Bundy to help him fly. You know something? I was twice as scared as you were. And that is a big waste of adrenaline, if you ask me. If your number's up, why fight it, right? And if it's not, why worry about it? Savage gets the airplane through a gap in the mountain. Savage never told anyone the enlisted man freaked out. In current times, Bundy talks about Mickey Doolin, Mark Stevens, a member of Savage's Greenland crew. He does not know where Mickey lives. The night before the hearing, McBain goes to see the assembled wreck. Out of the dark comes Mickey Doolin. Mickey says it was not Savage's fault that the plane crashed. Mickey flashes back to his time as a co-pilot for Savage in Greenland. The fear of flying was destroying Mickey. Savage always seemed relaxed and sang Blue Moon. Savage remained calm as they lost all the engines and glided into the field. Number four's out, feather it. Four's feathered. Field's at the end of this fjord, Nick. You mind telling me how you know that? I don't know. It's got to be. We're out of gas. McBain brings Mickey back to the current time. All of the drinks that Savage bought that night before the crash, or for Mickey. Mickey says Savage told him he would never leave unless he left something behind. Mickey continues that Savage spent years trying to get the sick man into Alcoholics Anonymous. McBain gives the dipsomaniac money to take a taxi to the hearing in the morning. In the morning, the hearing begins in the large hangar where the crash had been reconstructed. Lawyer Dillon, Bert Freed, represents some crash victims' families. Sitting behind Dillon 
is a woman that often appeared in the trial audiences on Perry Mason, 1957 to 1966, known affectionately as the little old lady in the hat. McBain is called to the stand. Crawford is giving a live news report. Sally and Mickey are present, and Martha is watching from her room. McBain discusses the three possibilities, sabotage, mechanical, or human error. As you know, in the beginning, there was a strong possibility of sabotage. That was ruled out or left to two other possibilities, either human or mechanical failure. And when the mechanical failure was ruled out, that left the one other, which was the human failure. Also left us a scapegoat by the name of Jack Savage. McBain defends his friend while Dylan acts like a jackass. McBain explains how all of the elements have conspired to contribute to the crash. He doesn't want to say fate. The audience reacts badly to his comments. He then basically says, it is God's will. The audience and the lawyers go nuts. The company asks for a recess to prepare to throw McBain under the bus. Stillman and the team come into McBain's office. As they begin to rage at him, Martha calls and says she believes what he said at the hearing. The board of directors are insisting that McBain be fired immediately. McBain says he wants to replicate the flight using the same conditions. The hard part is McBain has to convince Martha to go along on the test flight. She is the only one who knows firsthand what happened on the flight. As he talks to her, a delivery boy shows up with her cleaned and pressed stewardess uniform. She freaks out. Sawyer helps prepare the plane for the test by loading sandbags for cargo and passenger weight. Al Robinson, John Hubbard, signs on for the test as co-pilot, and Sawyer volunteers as the engineer. McBain's plan is to follow the timeline of the crash. At the last minute, Martha overcomes her PTSD and boards the plane for the test flight. Martha begins performing her duties as the pilot goes through the checklist. When the engines light, Martha is visibly stricken. Bundy and Sally are waiting on the flight line. Oddly, the wind is the same as the night of the crash. Martha brings the coffee as the plane taxis. She shows McBain where the cup was placed on the console. Mickey arrives as the plane leaves the ground. The control tower uses a crash tape recording to help the simulation. McBain cuts the right engine on schedule. The plane lurches and then they feather the engine and simulate cutting off fuel and power to the engine. Martha confirms the sequence. Following the recording, they simulate the radio being out. The control tower calls the test flight back and the radio goes out for real. The alarm on the left engine goes off. Martha is freaking out. McBain orders the crew to restart the right engine. However, it doesn't come back on until the beach is in sight. McBain pulls the plane out of a dive. He begins his landing approach when he sees the spilled coffee on his console. McBain has Sawyer pull the panel and sees it's full of coffee. McBain says the short circuit made it seem like the left engine was also out. McBain has the crew restart the left engine and brings the plane home. Sawyer is also happy that it wasn't Savage's fault. McBain tells Martha the coffee spill was not her fault. He says it will be fixed in the fleet and this type of accident will never happen again. McBain tells Martha that Savage said he would never die without leaving something behind. McBain sees Savage's friends waiting. He takes Martha to meet them. Conclusion. Oh, that's not right. No. Naturally, no commercial aviation company would sign on to be featured in this film. For this film, the team took a DC-7 and made it look like a modern commercial aircraft. Ernest K. Gann wrote a book that detailed his many flying adventures before, during, and after World War II. The story in this movie is not really in the book, and Gann claimed that he had his name removed from the project because he was unhappy with the results. Chapter 17 of Gann's book is about recreating an engine failure in a test flight but the cause was not a coffee spill. Chapter 18 is similar to the events depicted in another great aviation film, The High and the Mighty, 1954. There was an extensive array of actors in this film. Since many were in flashback, Glenn Ford was the only actor to work with most others. The plot device used for this film was a single person interviewing many people to find out about another dead person. This method was most famously used in the Orson Welles-directed Citizen Kane, 1941. This film tanked when it was released and lost money for the studio. However, it's an exciting tale and a pretty good watch. Just don't watch it while you're flying. More famous short summary, three things that you don't want to run out of when you're flying 
is airspeed, altitude, and ideas. This show is now completely free and independent, brought to you without ads. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe and leave a review where you get your podcast. It really helps the show get found. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show at ClassicMovieRev.com. Beware the Moors. <laughs>